Hello everyone, this is Karen O'Hara, Director of Marketing and Communications with WorkCare. Welcome to the seventh week of our series on preventing and managing COVID-19 in the workplace. We really appreciate your continued participation and to anyone who's joining us for the first time, we welcome you. This session is being recorded and will be available in about 24 hours on our YouTube channel. During the session, Alexis will post the address for that channel. All of the questions and answers are summarized at the conclusion of the presentation, and they will be posted on our website along with all the previous weeks. And you can find that at www.workcare.com. Please submit your questions during the session using the Q&A function on Zoom. Our speaker today is Dr. Anthony Harris, who's a board-certified occupational medicine physician. He's WorkCare's Vice President for On-Site Clinical Operations and an Associate Medical Director. As our lead clinician for our COVID-19 response, we really appreciate him taking time out of his busy schedule to offer these weekly updates, which we found have been very useful and informative internally and we hope for all of our clients. So now I'll turn it over to him. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Karen. And thanks everyone for joining us again. It's my pleasure to talk today about something that everyone has been asking about. Uh, and it, obviously it's COVID related, but we're going to spend some time uh, nerding out on uh, the strategy uh, to bringing the workforce back safely here. Uh, so we're going to get, you know, the typical updates. If you're new to uh, for, for us uh, joining us today, we are going to talk briefly on the clinical update, the microbiology, epidemiology, uh, and some prevention. But we're going to spend a lot of our time really drilling down into uh, what are we to do uh, in terms of the workforce coming back as the White House has laid out their plan for phase one, two, and three, opening the economy, right? Uh, and so we're going to be very pragmatic, uh, very specific to the strategy, uh, and we're going to be as bold as to even be prescriptive as to what you should do uh, based upon our clinical expertise and experience uh, with uh, not just obviously pandemics uh, with uh, SARS in 2003 and, uh, and uh, MERS, but also with what we're dealing with today and the technology that we have uh, at hand uh, to leverage. So without further ado, uh, we'll get into some of the clinical update here. And there's not much, right? There hasn't been a whole lot of new symptoms that uh, have been described in clinical literature. CDC has updated some of their symptoms to include the shakes with the chills, and they are including now um, the uh, loss of sense of taste and touch excuse me, lost a sense of taste and smell. Um, uh, but if you've been joining us, you know that we started reporting those symptoms uh, almost a month ago, I would say. Um, so uh, no, nothing uh, terribly new. Uh, COVID toes were presented last week. Uh, when we talk about, though, uh, the update on microbiology, we're going to spend a little time here just making sure that everybody is on the same page, and this is very important, about uh, testing and when the tests are appropriate at what phase of the illness, okay, COVID-19 illness. Uh, and so when we talk about, uh, and we've presented this uh, graphic before, and we talked about the different phases of illness, um, but specifically for testing, uh, it's appropriate to test early uh, in illness with regard to looking for particles of the virus, okay? That's the antigen test, all right? That's the, the swab classically in the uh, nares or in the uh, nasal pharynx. Uh, some of the tests uh, can be done with oral pharynx swabs. Um, there are even a couple tests uh, that are hitting the market uh, with uh, some early FDA uh, UE, uh, excuse me, uh, emergency use uh, authorization that uh, can can uh, use saliva as a sample, okay? That's not the majority, but uh, they're, they're approaching uh, a point at which you'll see more of that on the market. But the antigen testing specifically is uh, showing that an individual has the virus. Um, they may or may not be symptomatic at that point. 
right? We know there's a window uh, of about two to three days in which someone can contract COVID-19 uh, COVID and be asymptomatic until they present with uh, the symptoms that you're all familiar with, right? Uh, and so that's a window of opportunity for capturing and articulating uh, illness there. Now, uh, some people may be asymptomatic their entire uh, experience with COVID-19. We know uh, uh, a 30 to 40 percent of people uh, present that way, right? sometimes even higher. So we can capture those individuals with antigen testing. Uh, the antigen testing along with antibody testing becomes more relevant in the second phase of infection once your body starts to form an immune response to the, to the virus, meaning seven days into the illness, IG, IgM shows up first, uh, immunoglobin M shows up first, and we can detect that. And what that means is that, uh, yes, you have active disease, you have the ability to transmit the disease, but your body is responding appropriately and we can see that appropriate response with IgM at first and then followed by IgG. Now, when we talk about recovery, when we talk about late disease, um, we can see immunity to vis-a-vis uh, -vis IgM and IgG. Uh, if it's really late in the uh, recovery phase, uh, then IgM goes away and usually only IgG is present, okay? So now we can see a historic picture of disease with uh, antibody testing whereas uh, antigen testing will be negative once you've recovered from the illness. And so get okay, all these concepts and this uh, testing uh, paradigm in your, in your mind, because we're going to talk about this later as it pertains to the testing strategy that we're recommending for return to work uh, with the general population. So when we talk about updates for testing, again, uh, FDA continues to uh, authorize more serological tests under the emergency use authorization. Everyone has access to it through the internet. We can share those links with you later. Um, but the number of tests of, that are under this approval have increased to now 50. Uh, two weeks ago, we were down around 32 to 36. Now we're up to 50. That's a good sign, obviously, in terms of increasing the utilization of testing in regards to opportunity for us to test the workforce. We're, we're, we're making progress, right? Can we test the entire workforce tomorrow? No, right? Um, but we'll talk more about what the testing picture looks like updated to this week. We present on those numbers week to week. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide. We've presented it now twice. I'm hopeful that everyone is up to speed with what the rapid PCR test looking for antigen means if it's positive, what IgM and IgG mean if they're positive. Uh, you can refer back to this to get uh, caught up. Uh, and, and again, uh, these are the three different tests that we are recommending for testing in the return to work scenario, uh, and we'll talk about how to deploy this from a practical standpoint uh, in a bit. What I do want to spend some time on right now, though, is what uh, presents as sometimes confusing uh, uh, language around the reliability of testing. Okay, uh, you'll hear the terminology sensitivity and specificity. Sensitivity is um, we want high sensitivity and we want high specificity for a very reliable test. So, what does that mean? A highly sensitive test means that if I have the disease, how likely am I to detect it with the test that's being offered, right? So if you have COVID-19 and you have a negative test, right, quote unquote, failed the test, right, in this, in this articulation, uh, this illustration, um, what's the likelihood that I actually don't have the test, uh, have the disease? And so we know that if we do real-time PCR, the negative, the false negative rate is 30%. That hasn't changed very much in terms of real-time PCR. That's the swab to the nose looking for antigen, okay? Uh, low sensitivity means that number goes higher. So sensitivity for a real-time PCR is not phenomenal, right? 30% is, is, is not great. Uh, we take the test twice, it goes down to 9%, three times goes down to 3% false negative rate, right? When we look at specificity, we're looking at um, uh, specifically if a test comes back positive, quote unquote, pass the test in this illustration, what's the likelihood that I actually have the disease we're looking for and not some other disease, right? Uh, some other illness. So in this case, if I have a positive COVID test, 
what's the likelihood that it's actually detecting COVID versus something else. This number has generally been higher for the test available, particularly for um, the tests that we're deploying at WorkCare. Uh, we're looking at a sensitivity of about 86% and a specificity of 100%, right? Um, so we, when we articulate um, the reliability uh, and describe it about testing, this is what we mean. Okay, uh, and so as we get into the epidemiology, we're going to have a, a very uh, intentional myopic view, uh, looking more at the United States versus other countries at this point for this presentation today. So let's look at total confirmed cases in the U.S. Um, you know, this was last week. Where are we this week? Uh, we're approaching a million, right? If you look at some data, uh, ex-U.S. data on uh, prevalence uh, uh, here in the U.S., we're at 1.01 million cases. Uh, CDC has a slightly lower number than that, 950,000 or so. Um, but if we look at uh, daily confirmed cases um, per million, right, uh, we know this number, we report on this number week to week. Uh, that number is high for the U.S. Uh, on par with Italy and Spain. Uh, specifically, though, daily, num daily confirmed uh, uh, deaths now uh, is, is about, uh, in, with this logarithmic, or excuse me, with this linear curve, uh, right around uh, six, right? Six per million, uh, over six, about seven, so approaching seven per million people in the US, okay? Uh, CDC has updated some of their maps uh, and we can see now um, the deepening of the incidence of disease uh, across the US, right? Uh, and if we look at, uh, CDC maps, I, I do recommend if you haven't done yet, you can go look up your state and go look up your county in terms of cases uh, by county, right? And, and we can do this now uh, as we uh, talk about the paradigm of testing uh, to, to look at geographic risk. Uh, and we'll mention that more here in a second. Total confirmed cases in the U.S., this is the uh, graph we've been looking at to understand are we flattening the curve uh, with regard to total confirmed uh, on, on an ongoing basis. And if we look at where we were last week versus where we are this week, uh, how rapidly that increase uh, is, is the curve, right, is the actual slope of this curve. This is a logarithmic curve, follows the classic S curve of uh, a pandemic. And so we are continuing to see again last week versus this week, uh, a continual flattening of the curve. It ain't flat, right? We're having more and more, uh, but uh, it's, it's not uh, escalating. Uh, with the same high, high slope that we had initially. That's a good sign. When we talk about total uh, tests that uh, is being conducted uh, in the U.S. compared to ex-U.S., we've been number one for several weeks. We continue to be, we're over 4 million tests total conducted in the U.S. When we look at that number from last week to this week, we're now over 5 million. And if we look at then total tests per thousand uh, individuals in the U.S., uh, again, last week we were, or two weeks ago rather, uh, we were number three. Last week we jumped up to number two behind Italy, and we're still number two. Uh, currently, we're just catching up a little bit more. So again, all positive indications that the availability of testing is increasing, uh, and we will have uh, several uh, scenarios in which to entertain uh, return to work with regard to testing um, with, with, with increasing availability. So let's get into uh, some of the prevention uh, concepts here. I wanted to present this uh, again in terms of the paradigm that we have as clinicians uh, regarding return to work. We have to consider exposure. We have to consider level of disease in terms of onset duration and severity. We want to look at infectiousness, uh, duration of time away in the quarantine situation. And we want to look at the return to work scenario with regard to ability to social distance, uh, protective personal protective equipment, et cetera, right? And, and certainly those considerations of corporate policy we want to take into account. All those are uh, the different metrics we use when we talk about return to work uh, and considering on an individual basis who's ready and who um, we may need to hold off on. 
uh, if we look at and review briefly here, the White House uh, or the the, yeah, the White House administration's um, uh, push for opening the economy again. Uh, again, they're recommending social distancing, the temperature checks, uh, but they're also talking about monitoring the workforce. We presented it last week. I wanted to reiterate this because again, this is germane to our uh, strategy on return to work and testing uh, in, in that piece of what we're offering. Uh, so developing and implementing policy policies and procedures, uh, again, for contact tracing is important. We won't touch on that very much today. Uh, we will be speaking uh, perhaps more to that next week. But if we look at phase one, again, uh, encouraging telework is still the prominent uh, feature of this phase, right? Return to work uh, of workers in, in, in different waves, so to speak. They say phases here, but different waves is what we presented last week. Cleaning the common area, closing the common areas, uh, holding still tight to non-essential travel, and then uh, recommendations for accommodations with, with uh, those who have uh, underlying condition is what's described by the administration. Uh, when we talk about what uh, phase two looks like again, it's still encouraging telework, um, but it's now opening, uh, uh, still and still closing the common areas, but it's now allowing you to do um, more in regards to not monitoring. Uh, again, it's confusing a little bit in terms of what the CDC recommends versus what the White House is recommending in different phases. We're going to tell you what uh, aligns with our recommendations uh, in terms of what you should be doing to be uh, not just conservative, but to be in the best practice of protecting your workers. Phase three from the White House is, hey, uh, this is unrestricted staffing, uh, and we know there will be a new normal after uh, all is said and done, and we'll talk about what that looks like. So going back to phase one, this is where we're going to focus the rest of our time, right? This is the here and now. We're in phase one of reopening the economy. It's already happening in various states, various municipalities. So what are we to do uh, with these declarations of re-entering the workforce, right? Uh, again, uh, this is what uh, CDC is recommending with regard to uh, the reopening uh, and uh, contact, uh, uh, limiting contact with social distancing, obviously strongly recommended still. Uh, when we talk about um, uh, the screening, uh, the pre-screen is still recommended. Regular, regular monitoring is recommended. Pre-screening is the piece that uh, looks at temperature, right? And most uh, um, uh, places are doing now some type of temperature monitoring, whether it's self-reported or uh, having boots on the ground uh, to enter the facilities with infrared thermography. And then uh, the regular monitoring is recommended um, uh, for those symptoms beyond just a temperature monitoring, right? Uh, the, the health, the occupational health program component of it. Uh, wearing the PPE is also recommended, obviously, along with the other components we mentioned earlier with social distancing. Uh, but these things should be, uh, uh, from our uh, understanding of best practice currently, should be mandated, right, by the employer. Uh, and you have the ban, you have the support from EEOC and ADA to do that mandate, right? And so we know certain municipalities are actually requiring this by law uh, in, in parts of Ohio and Delaware uh, and Pennsylvania, obviously, uh, Detroit area. So again, we presented this last week here um, in, in terms of the first wave uh, of uh, uh, workers to re-enter the workplace. And so these waves, um, we added one uh, characteristic to it, and that's geographic location, right? Uh, we talked about the um, uh, first wave uh, characteristics, except for the geographic location last week. And, and if there's low incidence and uh, low incidence of sustained widespread disease, uh, we recommend considering that uh, for the first wave of individuals. And certainly that's a risk-based approach. So when we talk about the daily screen and what that looks like, when we talk about the risk stratification and what that looks like, uh, we know that these are two components that will exist uh, uh, moving forward here. Apologies for the background. We're gonna uh, call an audible here uh, real quick. And we're gonna, Dim, uh, we're going to show this without the background. Beautiful. All right, so um, the daily screen and risk stratification will be part of the new normal, right? Um, and, and that's for the foreseeable future until we have a vaccine. And that's well into 2021, uh, most are saying, right, in, in the clinical community. So this is the first step 
to your program for return to work. Without this in place, it becomes difficult to um, orchestrate the remainder of what we're going to suggest here in the program that we're rolling out with employers, um, because you, you're going to miss an opportunity to capture workers uh, with, with this approach for symptom, symptomatology, as well as uh, um, those things that present without a, temp, uh, out, uh, without a fever. Right. And so if we look at the daily screen, we're monitoring for symptoms outside of fever. Risk stratification is necessary um, because we need to understand not just who needs to stay home. Right. But for how long? Right. It doesn't necessarily mean you're stuck for 14 days. We have to stratify your risk for COVID and for other uh, uh, infectious illness. And so th these are all components that uh, should be done in conjunction with your local occupational health provider. That, so that's the first step, right? Putting into place, and we mentioned it last week briefly, putting into place a solid um, a defense, which is a strong offense, right? Uh, the second feature is then having a, um, a full uh, a kind of end-to-end -end management pr perspective of the return to work uh, process, right? And so it looks at uh, baseline testing, COVID-19 risk appraisal, scheduled testing, and then finally, COVID surveillance. And we're going to get into each of these so we can uh, help you understand what we're, what we're referring to with each of these levels. The first level then being baseline testing, OK? Uh, baseline testing, let me see if I can go back into presentation mode here. Beautiful. So baseline testing is important um, to uh, understand three things, right, of the population. And again, we're suggesting that uh, at, with availability of testing for those uh, hotspots, Let's test 100% of the population and get a baseline. Why? Because we have to understand who has active disease and needs to be self-quarantined. That's pretty straightforward. We need to know who has past exposure to disease and have a low likelihood of contracting or transmitting, transmitting the illness, right? Those people, again, are kind of in that free and clear phase of not having to undergo uh, routine monitoring or surveillance because the likelihood of them actually contracting, uh, again, COVID-2 uh, COVID is low. Those people who are naive to the illness, though, never had the disease, they are still vulnerable, can contract and transmit, those are the individuals with, in which we need to have a solid program in place to help monitor and uh, keep them at home when they're ill, keep them at work when they're healthy. And so that's the first step. The second step of this comprehensive program is doing a uh, risk appraisal. So after your baseline test, you can understand uh, those individuals in each of those buckets we mentioned. And then we're going to further stratify those naive uh, people, those persons naive to the illness. And we're going to place them into high, medium, and low risk based on demographics and behavior. Now, this may look familiar, and I hope so, because this is what we do uh, with other uh, chronic illness when we take a health risk appraisal, right? We've taken a similar approach in understanding uh, uh, individuals for COVID-19 specifically, what is your risk of actually contracting in the community uh, in particular? And we can then uh, articulate risk so that uh, your workforce that's returning won't have the same uh, pro won't necessarily have the same process for monitoring and testing uh, based uh, based upon geographics and behavior. What do, so let's talk about the uh, aspect of what that looks like, right? So scheduled testing uh, would be something that uh, is recommended. Uh, for those individuals that are naive to, uh, again, the virus, and we need to recommend uh, at what frequency, right? We're, the last thing we want to do in the clinical community is to suggest that everyone get tested all the time, right? That'd be pointless. There's no clinical significance to that piece of it, right? Um, what we want to do in terms of window of opportunity of detection with testing specifically, again, is to test those, is to capture those individuals that are, one, asymptomatic, Right, because if you have symptoms, we're going to get you with the uh, the good offense, the uh, daily screen, and the risk stratification. If you're asymptomatic, though, whether you're asymptomatic because you just are going to be asymptomatic in that population who never present with symptoms and still can trans uh, 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 transmit the illness, or if it's that window of opportunity we mentioned earlier, where you have you you have the illness, but you and you can transmit, but you don't necessarily have symptoms yet. Those, those two uh, use cases are the windows of opportunity for us to capture uh, individuals and have them appropriately self-quarantined uh, from the workplace 
because we have to be ready for that inevitability when we when the fall hits or when kids go back to school of you know being asymptomatic the younger population uh, in in the schools uh, transmitting COVID potentially and then bringing that home to mom and dad right and mom and dad showing up to work uh, there's a window of opportunity to test and capture those individuals now again that's not an every day or an every week or even a bi-week scheduling um, that is specific though for an individual where they live and and, and behavior component to it right if i'm uh, routinely in uh, a social setting where I'm around a lot of people, right? Um, then my risk is by default higher if I'm in a geographic that has widespread sustained illness, right? And, or transmission rather. So those are the things we're gonna articulate in this program and then move forward with so that we're not, uh, so that we have order to the testing. And again, I told you, we're going to be bold in this uh, uh, um, game plan here, and we know that uh, th this is beyond what uh, is recommended currently by CDC and OSHA and, and other uh, governing bodies because, for the most part, they've been kind of silent on these matters, right? Uh, they've not given us much guidance as to what is the practical next step to do in the workplace to bring my workers back safely. Uh, and then finally, uh, in this paradigm, it's the surveillance program. Uh, the daily screen, the thermography, the schedule testing play a role in what we're calling now the COVID surveillance program. And it's similar to, again, a program that you would have in place uh, for respiratory surveillance, for hearing conservation, et cetera, right? Um, these, the difference being, right, COVID not, is not necessarily a workplace exposure. OSHA has said, no, this is community-based, uh, and right now we're not considering workplace exposures under this COVID uh, epidemic or pandemic. Um, but yet and still, the requirements from uh, regulatory bodies are being placed, even municipalities are placing that requirement on employers to keep the workplace safe under general duty clause, right? So again, what we're proposing is a process by, by which you can execute the demands that are being placed on you. And we're partnering with you to help you pull that off uh, in, in as much as a plug and play fashion as we can. So again, uh, to recap, baseline testing, risk appraisal, schedule testing, for those only who should be in that bucket and the naive uh, uh, individuals. Uh, and then finally, this is a part of a, a comprehensive COVID uh, surveillance program. So number three is how do you do it practically, right? We know the availability of tests aren't ubiquitous. We just went through that, right? In terms of total tests per thousand population. Uh, and so we need to have a process by which we can actually effectuate this plan tomorrow. And what does that look like? It's geographic based. So in the same way we look at the burden of disease, this is the burden of disease as of yesterday in the US, we identify these locations and how they overlap with the operations that you have in, di in different locations. And then that's where we focus our efforts for the high, medium and low need in terms of uh, temporal rollout of this type of process, this type of program. Right, and so we focus resources on where resources are going to give you the best return on investment, not just on, you know, obviously an, a business operation standpoint, but on impact to prevention with the worker population that you have. And so that's the approach that we're taking. That's what we can pull off with the data that we capture through step one and step two, that daily screen and risk stratification. And then finally, again, uh, getting into the uh, on mass return to work is gonna be straightforward because now we have the data to show uh, from the risks that we've cap from the data and the risk that we've captured. Uh, and then the fourth uh, piece of this puzzle, right, is the availability of testing. And we know that the availability is going to increase. And we know that the uh, specificity and sensitivity and the accuracy of these tests are going to still be across the board. And so we want you to not have to worry about the accuracy of these tests because that's our job as clinicians, right? So we take on the task of um, building into the program those tests that we've already vetted and we've already said, this is a test that's reliable as the tests are available on the market. And, to, to, and the distinction is clinical determination, right? If the test won't help us diagnostically make a clinical decision, then we're not gonna recommend it. And again, uh, the whole goal is to uh, be able to offer as soon as possible the capabilities at different levels at different ge geographics. That looks like, uh, in practicality, the, the, the program that we put together uh, in California will look like the program we put together for you in, in Florida or you know, in Georgia, but the tests may be different due to uh, availability. 
uh, nonetheless, those tests will have been vetted and we can rely on the results uh, from a clinical decision-making process. And so with that, I know we captured a lot as we normally do week to week. I want to hit the pause button. We want to open it up to questions. So let's get into it. Thank you. Okay, let's take a deep breath and we'll go into our questions. Um, let's start with this one. I think it will help clarify some of the things you covered really quickly about the process, the steps of the process. The question is, can you detail work care screening services? I'm pitching this to my boss and I need a walkthrough of how it works to keep sick people out and manage sick people back to work. So I thought maybe you could quickly go over our algorithm and um, how we're doing surveys uh, um, online and then how we're managing cases using uh, telehealth applications. Absolutely, I don't have a workflow of it here, um, but it's rooted in um, what we're doing with daily screen, right? So we're screening 100% of the workforce, whether you're home or at work, we're capturing who's ill and who's not, who needs to come to work and who doesn't. Um, if you're at home, we're then triaging and diagnosing and uh, getting those individuals tested appropriately uh, in the risk stratification piece. And then we're doing the return to work uh, evaluation based upon the data that we've already captured. Um, so uh, in, in short, those are the three uh, steps that we've instituted. We've been doing that for uh, the better part of a month now, I would say. Um, and it's working well to, again, make it a seamless process for the employee. Uh, certainly there are more details to the and nuances to to, uh, each uh, instance of the uh, experience with the employer and what we de uh, deploy, but we're happy to share that with you in, in the follow-up. So whoever asked that question, please reach out to us. We can push information your way uh, so that we can help out. And there seems to be quite a few questions about temperature screening regarding what it actually constitutes a fever, what, what degree of temperature should you be looking for? And um, one person's asking about forehead strip thermometers and whether they're appropriate for, to use for this purpose. Sure, we've stuck with the um, uh, CD recommendation for what constitutes a fever of 100.4. Um, why? Because uh, so far that has been um, a, a delineation of, uh, again, clinically what should happen next. 100.4, should you stay home? We say yes, right? Uh, if you alter that and say, okay, it needs to be 90, 99 this or you know, uh, even lower, then it, it becomes more difficult in terms of actually capturing a clinical determination of illness, right? You may have an elevated, we, we know that 99.6 uh, is within normal range for, for many. Right, and so do you keep everybody home that hits that range? No, uh, it becomes more of a uh, um, uh, convoluted clinical determination if you have a lower um, a number for an absolute cutoff of fever. 100.4 makes it clear. You have 100.4 or higher, you stay home. Uh, so that's, that, that's uh, how we move forward. Uh, and then in terms of testing of temperature, um, the forehead strips, whether you're using IR thermography or uh, infrared videography, um, the, there are uh, best practices in place. Um, we know that skin temperature variability is significant. It's affected by environment. We know uh, and we have reviewed studies that looked at uh, if you're going to measure temperature looking at the face, either with the IR thermography or otherwise, what is the best area of the face to look at? And we know it's actually not the forehead. Um, it's a side, based, uh, a side view of the face and it's an average of the face um, that have the highest correlation to core temperature. So again, we can share those uh, um, learned uh, with you uh, after this uh, for sure and then um, talk about strategy if you are deploying uh, different types of thermography whether self-reported or otherwise. Okay, as usual we're getting a lot more questions all of a sudden. Uh, are you suggesting that employers institute testing on their own or should it be done by their medical provider or public health officials? 
No testing on your own. And in fact, if it's an FDA uh, EUA uh, emergency use authori authorized test, you can't even get it on your own, most likely. It has to be ordered uh, by a clinician. These are tests that are conducted, uh, serologic tests that are conducted by what's called CLIA, CLIA authorized or CLIA certified uh, labs. Okay. And so uh, right now on the market, there are one or two tests. I think I showed it on the last slide here. Um, one of these tests, uh, the uh, lab core test is a test that is sent for home use, currently available to only healthcare workers and first responders, um, but it's a swab for, uh, to take the sample and then you send it back to the CLIA certified lab for them to test. So again, these are not tests that are readily available at all for employers to buy and to implement. It's only in conjunction with your uh, local health provider or occupational health uh, clinicians. Okay, and then regarding specificity of tests and sensitivity, um, could you talk a little bit more about the blood draw test versus the nasal swab and other testing methodology that may be emerging and, and which would likely be the most accurate? Sure, so those two things are, um, uh, it shouldn't be conflated together in terms of method versus accuracy, because there's a lot of variables that go into accuracy. Is the reagent uh, um, appropriate and what's the reliability of the reagents used, right? Uh, the sampling piece is, is, is relevant, right? Is the sampling a, um, a oral pharynx or nasal pharynx approach? And is the individual taking the sample uh, doing uh, the proper process to capture uh, the best opportunity to, to, to evaluate the uh, sample. Uh, so we know those all play a role. Um, so the test by itself doesn't necessarily correlate to increased accuracy in regards to method of the test. It's specific to each manufacturer. And that's why um, you've seen such uh, attention paid to by the FDA in terms of what's cleared and what's authorized and what's not. Because again, XUS availability of tests is, is uh, about three to four times more than what we've had over the uh, last weeks uh, available in the US. And, and vetting each one of them individually is, is important. In terms of you know, ease of use, that's going to continue to improve. Ease of use and accuracy will equal increase uh, testing, right? So we know that the saliva tests uh, that are under uh, study right now, if they are shown to be accurate and can uh, be cleared by FDA, obviously will be far better in terms of uh, uh, patient or, or employee experience than the uh, deep nasal swabs or even the uh, pinprick uh, from, from the serologic uh, test with the blood. Um, but, but, but in terms of what's available now, um, you know, we, we believe that the point of care tests uh, have enough sensitivity and specificity to be clinically relevant. And that's what we're deploying with uh, mobile lab uh, support um, uh, with our third party. Okay, um, here's a question about evaluating symptoms. Can you please provide some commentary around handling of employees who present with nasal congestion? The WHO has indicated that this is potentially a symptom of the virus, but it's also a symptom of seasonal allergies. Indeed, um, who has indicated that? And again, it's um, no departure in that scenario from best practice with regard to hand hygiene, cough hygiene, et cetera. So everyone should be practicing those universal precautions, so to speak, um, so that uh, we're helping prevent the spread. Everyone should be wearing a cloth mask. So if you're congested and you don't have a cloth mask on, one, uh, shame on you. And two, um, you know, you're not still uh, practicing best practice for the entire population, meaning if you are not in a home setting or you know, you're out and about, you should be wearing a mask. We know that employers are requiring a cloth mask or equivalent in the workplace. And we stand behind that um, because that's what's going to get us through uh, this, this period of minimizing the transmission of the, the illness. Okay, another question about um, screen screening people for return to work. If, if someone has diabetes, high blood pressure, or another condition that makes them more vulnerable to, the, to exposure, do they have to disclose that to their employer if they're asking to remain in a remote working situation rather than go back to work in the workplace? 
Uh, if I can, if I can repeat just to make sure I understand the question correctly, if I have pre-existing condition that increases my risk for illness um, uh, from COVID-19, uh, do I, am I obligated to uh, disclose that to my employer? Uh, and Correct. Yeah, so that, no, you're not obligated um, to report your pre-existing conditions. Uh, and in fact, employers are, are not advised to inquire who has pre-existing conditions that increase their risk uh, for poor outcomes with COVID. Now, when I say that, I say that in regards to what they are allowed to collect information on for screening purposes. Those type of questions, pre-existing condition, uh, should not be a part of screening um, uh, that is communicated back to the employer without uh, participation of your occupational or your health uh, provider or your cl local clinician, right? That is HIPAA protected information. So um, the questions that are permissible uh, certainly are, are you ill right now from a infectious uh, uh, illness? And that's what uh, a general duty. And again, I'm not a lawyer, but in terms of what we've seen in practice, what has worked well to um, uh, both protect the workplace and not raise any flags from an ADA or EEOC standpoint is sticking to the guidance that CDC has given, uh, certainly those things that are aligned with WHO in regards to screening. Now, there are screening protocols out there that help an individual determine their own risk like CDC has on their website. That is not a screening that should be done by an employer and collect the data on because they are asking about pre-existing conditions only to help the individual understand their personalized risk, right? And so there's different, two different approaches uh, to, to those type of uh, screening questionnaires. And again, sticking to what an employer should be asking is, is limited to those things that help keep the workplace safe, not understand an individual's specific risk for poor outcomes due to pre-existing conditions. Okay, um, that concludes our session today. As those of you who've joined us in the past know we try to keep it to 40 minutes in the interest of protecting everyone's time during this very hectic period. Um, so we'll answer the remaining questions and summarize the ones Dr. Harris has just answered in our weekly Q&A. A number of the questions we received today have already been addressed in previous Q&A, so you may want to take um, opportunity to look at those past ones to, to get your questions answered. Specifically, a couple examples are uh, regarding um, the use of IR thermometers and um, whether the virus can be recontracted and some, uh, some of the other issues that we've covered in the past. Um, so I want to thank you again for joining us today and thank Dr. Harris for his expertise and we'll look forward to having you back again next week. As always, thank you everyone and stay safe.